Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Green Effect Podcast. This is episode number 33, and this is part two of two of our Realtor Roundtable with Annabelle Tranter, Jenny Fisher, and Joe Dykes. Before we get into the topics we're going to be talking about, don't forget, shameless plug time. This show is sponsored by Ignite Volleyball Club. If you're looking for a program for your little guy or gal uh, to get involved in, all fun, not a lot of competitiveness. Of course, we do have competitive programs as well for the older kids. Make sure you visit our website, www.ignitevolleyball.ca. On to what we're looking at in part two. So we're going to dive into some tough topics. First one is around offers and how they balance the expectations of their clients when they're dealing with these crazy, insane, no inventory type situations, multiple offers, the whole bit. How do they deal with working within a team of partners and how does it benefit them and their clients? We're going to talk about what they look at when they refer business to a mortgage person. No, a really great one like maybe me a home inspector, or even a lawyer. And how do they how do they find that that relationship is best managed? We dive into their funniest business stories. We've got some real doozies for this one. And finally, their one piece of advice they would give to someone looking to start a career in real estate right now. Without further delay, let's get going with Annabelle, Jenny, and Joe. Welcome to the Green Effect Podcast. Finance, life, business, and everything in between. And now, your host, Stephen Green. Uh, Investor clients versus owner occupied. So what are the differences? Do you guys prefer one over the other or just whoever lands at your doorstep, you're good to go, but... Do you have a preference? I mean, what's the difference between these two groups? Okay, of so investors, it's it's there's zero emotion, it's dollars and cents. If this works out, that works out, I will do it. If they have to pay over, they know they just have to sit for a year. It's going to be worthwhile again, or put some money into it. It's just it's just all dollars and cents. Um, you know, obviously somebody that's buying a house to live there with their family or start a family, that's emotion. They're putting emotion in it. It's their, it's their, it's their money. They have to really look at every dollar and cent to see if they can afford it, carry on their life, their lifestyle, right? So that's kind of my just quick take on it. Yeah. Jenny, I I work with a small builder, um, and I guess this year I closed quite a few homes for him, for for them. And the difference that I see, it's the same, it's there's not the emotion, and they can, I can. I can be brutally honest and because there's not that emotional connection. Whereas, you know, you're working with, you know, an owner occupied and, you know, they're they're moving out of their house and they brought their newborn baby to this house. So now all of a sudden that baby's going to school. So there's a whole lot of emotion that's all tied up when, up in it. And then to say, well, you know what? The carpet kind of stinks in the basement. You know, what can we, can we get somebody in to, you know, clean the carpets? Or you're working with, seniors and you're trying to tell their kids all right well the house is dated but mom really loves that wallpaper you know so there's this whole so it's it that's the difference you just have to approach it it's a different approach you're reading the different body language because one's very analytical and one's emotional and even with the owner occupied depending on the personality type you can get those people that are the analyticals that you're approaching you know you're you're your business with them entirely different than you know the the mom and the dad with the the little ones, right? Yeah. Depending on, it's it's all about personality, I think, really. Yeah. And Annabelle, you, I mean, same question to you, but I also know you work with a lot of engineers. Yes. I Owner do. occupied people who are engineers, totally different dynamic. Talk What's about analytical, <laughs> right? Oh. Yeah. Like it's all in the details right there. Yeah. yeah. We've worked together on a few of those and I'm like, oh man. Yeah. I mean, great. It's it's fun because yeah. it's just, there's almost no emotion involved in an owner occupied home. But how do you deal with it? What's the differences you find? Well, I And think... they're like your people too, because you were, you worked with them at Blackberry too, right. right? And I, yeah. And I had done, when I was at Blackberry, my Six Sigma green belt, which is all analytics, right? So that 
that makes it a little bit easier. But yeah, there's a little bit less emotion there. Um, usually, uh, in most of those situations, the husband is the engineer, and the wife is not. And so you've got one person who's who's really looking at the numbers, and one person who's falling in love with the house, right? And so you're trying to find that balance. But I mean, you know what? I've even had the most analytical person walk into a house and go, "Oh, this is it." And you guys can probably just say the same thing. There's like nothing more satisfying than having someone fall in love with their house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I, I, myself, I I deal with a majority are investors. And uh, it's funny when I get a owner-occupied home, there's no investment properties. I, I kind of get the application done, and I kind of sit there, and I twiddle my thumbs like, well, now what do I do? Because the investor mortgages, you got to like, load this and load that and get tax returns and the whole bit. So even I prefer the investor part. Um, now, and again, I will work on any first-time home buyer just forever is listening. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's the investor side. It's just numbers, right? It's just very simple, very – it works or it doesn't. You know, you don't like the carpet, rip it up, right? Or like your clients, well, you got to get a carpet clean to make sure they feel good about it, right? So, okay, here's a tough one for everybody. So um, – and we seem to be going very perfectly in order. So, Joe, I'm going to throw this out to you first. Actually, I'm going to go to Annabelle first. That way that you got to struggle a little bit at the end to awesome. come up with something original. So um, it's kind of a crazy time right now. There's no inventory. Multiples. I was saying, Joe came in a little bit earlier, and I was saying uh, if I had a recording for every time I, I could just play for a client when they said, can I go firm, and I had to say no. I would just do it that way. It'd be a lot of years. I get, I get the question three times a day. That's who's telling them no. Oh, yeah, that's me right here, 100%, <laughs> right here. <laughs> I, and I tell realtors, by the way, I'm like, blame it on the bank. Just blame it on the bank. Any problems, you blame it on the bank. I think it's, we always did. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it's not my fault. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's the market. That's Stephen Green again. Um, how do you manage, and, and again, Annabelle, I'll come to you first with this. How do you manage the client having to go through eight different offers, lose on them all, and keep them going. How do you manage this crazy market we're in right now? Well, I think, you know, being up front and saying, listen, this is a crazy market, and it's particularly in certain price ranges. Um, and then the other piece is it's their house at the end of the day, right? And so when they're going in to put in that offer, I always say, you know, I'll have a client that'll say, well, what do you think we should offer? There's going to be five of them. What should we do? And I always say to my clients, take the number that works for you. So if you feel comfortable with a number and you get beat out by $1,000, you're not going to kick yourself in the butt that you didn't get that house. But if you get the house, you're not going to feel like you overpaid. And it's easy for me to say because I don't have the emotional investment that they do. Um, But I mean, you know, going back to my niece and nephew, my nephew and niece put in an offer on one. And they missed out on their first one by ten thousand dollars. And he called me and said, "Oh, Auntie, like I should have done that. That was in my budget." And I said, "Well, now you know for next time." And the next time he got it right, or they got their house. So, really, it's how comfortable are they with doing the offer? They need to pick their number, yeah, right. And it is a competitive market. It's too bad that we don't have more inventory for people. But let me digress a little bit, and we're Jenny. I'm going to come back to you with the same question. I've always been a proponent, and and I'll be interested to hear what you guys say. So I'm on the bank side. I'm telling people no all day long from the standpoint you can't go firm. What is your feeling that every offer should have at least either inspection or financing five business days, no matter what? Does that even the playing field? Does it make it worse? Does it make it better? What do you think? Joe? Well, it would even it. If every if everyone had to have it, it would totally even it. Jenny, it would absolutely even it yeah. because there's house houses that I've been in and my clients are going firm and I'm like, you need a home inspection. Yeah, oh yeah, hundred percent. And I want the home inspection, yeah. but it's not my choice, right? Yeah. It's like if you put a home inspection, you're not going to get this house. Oh, it's right? a nail in the coffin. It's totally going to mm-hmm. even the playing field. Yeah. Five days. Annabelle. It would even the playing field, but I think in some cases you don't, it's not beneficial to you to even the playing field. So I'll give you an example. To you, the listing agent or the selling? Sorry, the 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 listing or the the buying? To the buying side. So say, for example, um, Jenny has a client who deals with a lender who takes a lot of time to do mortgage financing. So she has to do her five-day condition. 
I can get it to you, you can get it back to me 24, 48 hours. My condition is now only one or two days. So that le playing field isn't leveled anymore, right? It's true. And if you tried to level the playing field, like to mandate something like that, it also hurts the seller, right? Because the seller wants to see that firm offer so they know that their house is officially sold. Because maybe they're waiting for that sale to happen so that they can buy or they can firm up on something they're buying, or they can do bridge financing, right? So would it level the playing field? Yeah, but should it? Like, should something like that happen? No, I don't think no, no, so. I don't agree it should happen. I'm just saying it would level it, would. it, on, the it buy, would level on the yeah. buying side. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think it would open up a whole new kettle of fish, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. um, right? Because it's something that it's not there. It, we're not doing it. No. And even last year, or in the year before, so many times we go out, have a home inspection done sitting on the counter for people to come in knowing we're getting yep. multiple offers. Mm -hmm. I really haven't seen that much lately, have you? We still do that. Yeah. Um, so I'm on a team and okay. that is one of the things that we do. Nice. Um, and it, it, some people care, some people don't. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then there's the people that show up to the house with their home inspector. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know, I was working with a, a client and we walked into a house um, in the west side of Kitchener, and there was probably, it, the house, the door was just open. Nobody, was, like, it was just, there was 20 people in front of me, all with their agents, and there was two home inspectors. Mm -hmm. And it just, because we knew the following day, I was on a Saturday, and we knew Sunday offers were going in, and it was going to be dealt with, you know? So, like, and people, like, those people who weren't sure, they prepared themselves that way, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I've always I've come up with this thought and, and only because I see it from the other side. So the offer gets done, they go firm. And yeah, sellers, they're done. They're good, their deal's firm. But then I'm looking at it from the other end where, okay, now I gotta try to put this together, right? And sometimes it's not a big deal. Most of the time the property value is not a problem, but it's those deals that are tough where I know these first time home buyers or second time or whatever have just rolled the dice and they're hoping for the best, right? And so that's where it becomes tough. But most people aren't gonna roll the dice. They're not gonna go firm unless they have a backup plan, right? So if it doesn't appraise high enough, they have extra cash, most whatever of the, the time. situation yeah. is. Most right? of the, but then sometimes emotion takes over because then I've seen that. I've well, seen that's some where stuff. we're supposed to help balance that out, right? Yeah, that could be another podcast, but it's, mm. uh, people, people do, they get so emotionally involved and they're like, hey, just go for it. And I'm like, you know, kind of like the inspection thing you're talking about, right? Well, like, that oh. was panic, right? Yeah. Because there's only one, like, if I don't jump now, we're not going to get anything, right? Mm -hmm. So you get this panic where, where people make those decisions. Is, these are huge decisions. Like, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And, you know, they you got to make it. you got to pull the trigger, you yeah. know? But then you the other person who's sitting back and they're not ready to make that decision and jump into the multiple offer situation and they lose out and they're kicking themselves and it's like, all right, well, when are we doing it? Yeah. Right? Like you, you, it's a tough one. So I'm going to have you keep going along those lines, Jenny, because I want to come back to that question. How, how do you, how do you balance the expectation of clients in these multiple situations? Like how, how do you manage these people? I think the biggest thing is making sure before I'm going out to see to see houses, I'll give people a, a freebie. Like we'll go out and see a house before they've got their pre-approvals and everything lined up, just so they know what we're getting into. And then it's like, okay, let's get all your your ducks in the line, ducks lined up, because this is this is the market that we're in, and we have to be prepared. Because if we go out next weekend and you find a house, and we we don't know about the money, like we're wasting everybody's time. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, so I think that's one of the biggest expectations. It's like, and if, if you're going to put more into it, then, and what if it doesn't appraise, where's that money coming from? So that people are aware, and this isn't now a conversation after the fact. So we lay it all out. It's, some people get a little bit nervous because of all the what ifs, mm -hmm. but I'd rather you're looking at what ifs than why didn't you tell me? Yeah. Right. For sure. For sure. And Joe, over to you, same question. Yeah, I mean, you guys both nailed so much of it. What, what I like to do is right away make sure they're pre-approved so we know how much they're looking for. And then second thing I like to do is 
I don't like to go, okay, hey, here, because you know how it works. They, oh, look at that, came on the market, it's four ninety five. Let's jump on that. I go, let me have a look. You know what? All those houses in that neighborhood sell for five sixty to five eighty. It's out of your price range. It's gonna go into multiple offers. Why don't we look at stuff that's on the market for ten days already? In your price range. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've been able to get my clients a good house in their price range instead of running and running and running and running. Yeah five offers, 10 offers, you know what I mean? Trying to get them the house that eventually we always we always win one, you know what I mean? But I also set that thing, if, if they are die on a heart, on a house, I'll say, okay, that house right now is maxed out at 540. So if it goes for 570, awesome for the seller, but I would not pay a dollar more than 540 for it. And they, you know, will, I'll say, if you want to go in at 540, you're comfortable with it, I'm comfortable with it. I think that also elevates your client's trust in you. Oh, sure. The other thing I think is important too is to say to your clients, okay, who is your mortgage broker? And do you mind if I have a conversation with that person? Mm -hmm. I know, Stephen, you've been working for some of my clients and, and we've, we've had that, we've been able to have those conversations. And it just, then they all almost feel like, okay, so my realtor and my mortgage broker are working together. And now I feel like peop there's more than one person who's got my back. Yeah. Like, Do you know how infrequent that is? It's not very really? often. Really? Yeah. Oh, like crazy. Like I'll be the one to reach out wow. to the selling agent and say, hey, heads up, I'm working on the deal for your client. Let me know if you have any questions. Sometimes I don't even hear back from them. But that is so rare. Yeah. It's it's insane. I'm I, always in touch with a mortgage broker right away. Yeah. And I, I, want that's a, I want a letter. I want something in my hand. So yeah. I know exactly. Or at least know who the heck's working on it yeah. if you know the person, right? Yep. So yeah, it doesn't happen often. Yeah. It's, I, I don't, that I don't get, I don't get. Cause I'm pretty sure when you guys are into these multiples, they're asking, tell me about the financing. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. if you ain't got an, an ain't got an no. answer, if you don't have an answer, then you got a, you got a bit of a problem too, right? I think right? one so. of the other tidbits about those expectations is if you're working with some people who, uh, like, let's just throw out, if they're pre-approved at 475, you're not looking at four houses that are priced at 450 to 475 yeah. right you you've got to almost say okay so we're, we're looking gonna look at the 4 to 425 range because those are the houses right now in this market that are going to that's where it's going to land mm -hmm. right or even the 399 which then they're like but 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 I want the four no well that 450 the 399 is going to be the that's right it is a 450 that's right. Right? we just have it masked as a 399 right now that's right, right. Yeah. so i think it's it's balancing that expectation that you know just because that's where your number is that's not what we're looking at we're going to look down here because that's where we're going to end and that's a that's a huge barrier or hurdle to jump over for people in their minds mm -hmm. well right? if you get it out there right away and explain it properly they're like oh i got gotcha. you and like you know, you go out like you like you said, you give that little one free showing. It's also like almost like that one free offer. Or they had their eye on a house that was at four fifty, and they thought they could get it. And you're like, oh look at that, it sold for five oh five oh five. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, okay, I got you, Joe. Yeah. You know, once they see that yeah. the house that they love, that they thought they could buy, and it goes for fifty or sixty thousand over, and they're like, whoa, I, there's no way I could touch that. Yeah. Then that sets resets their mindset. Yeah. yeah. Percentage, Annabelle, percentage of your, so in this crazy market, mm -hmm. percentage of your buyers who are settling on the home they're buying? I'd be really low. Okay. Um, I don't even think I had one this year that settled for the house that they were buying. Um, you know, we'll just keep looking until we find the right house. And if we have to go alternate sources, then we'll go alternate sources. So I had a couple of property guys deals, um, a com free, a private, um, where somebody wanted a very specific neighborhood and I went and door knocked it and found a property for them to move into. You know, you can't have people settle for houses because then they're gonna be unhap unhappy mm -hmm. with that house and then they're gonna be moving again. That's not what you want. Either I mean, you, you want the repeat business, don't get me wrong. Of course, But you absolutely. don't want somebody moving <laughs> Because they didn't like the house. Okay. Uh, how have you guys found that? Do you find that? I, I don't think I've actually had anybody who felt that they settled for a house. Yeah. No. Well, that's yeah. good. Me neither. Because that, that's that's where my first, that's one of my thoughts. That's where it went. I thought, okay. I, and I, I can almost see, you know, going through that where, okay, 
this is the 14th offer i'm not winning i just want to freaking get a house just get me a house right because my next follow-up question was going to be and we can still answer this question what percentage of your clients after they buy their first house are moving again within two or three years like what do you find with your clients joe um you know it's not a huge percentage but i definitely have clients that even when the first time they met me they were like joe this is my plan you know, I'm going to live in this one for two years. The market's going up. You know, I can I can say I've got a definitely a handful and a bit of clients that I have uh, sold, you know, two or three or even four houses in the five and a half years I've been in it because they keep wanting to go. And they'll be like, hey, if you see a house in a good area, and they're uh, most of the times a lot of the guys are really handy or our husband and wives are handy. So they'll go in and they'll do the necessary updates and stuff like that. They'll live there for just over a year and a bit. And then they'll put it on the market because they're all right doing that. You know, un, unlike, you know, at least myself, I like a house just to be my home. Mm-hmm. I'd like to be settled, right? But yeah, there's the repeat. And then anything happens, you know, there's death, there's divorce, you know, there's there's Job. all that kind of, yeah, all jobs, right. everything, right? Well, if you're a first time home buyer, 50% of them are gonna break up eventually, because that's the stats. Yeah. Sad, but true. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's a, there's a one of the agents here has a, the divorce certification. Mm-hmm. You can get divorced and, or gets um, certified in dealing with divorced couples. I'm like, really? Can you imagine what that course is like? Well, I think we, I think we all do it anyways. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> Without the course, it's definitely pretty yeah. intense. It, it takes it from a different perspective for sure. But yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, um, Jenny, you brought this up earlier. You were talking about working, um, you know, with the the mortgage person, the home inspector, working within a team, and and mm-hmm. I think um, any any clients that that I've worked with. You know, we, I try to hammer that home to them. You know, work with the people that we all can work together for you. Mm-hmm. So Annabelle can text me at ten o'clock at night, and Jenny knows where to get me, and Joe knows where to where to find me the whole bit. So, um, what just from a, a basic business perspective, what do you look for in that sort of a relationship within your teams? Home inspector, mortgage, lawyer. What do you guys look for, Jenny? I'll throw it to you first. You know what? I look for for people that I appreciate their level of service. And if it's a person that I would want to use myself, then you know what? We're going to be working together for a long time to come. Mm-hmm. If if we don't connect, if I don't like, you know, if there's something about the person that we just don't connect, if it's a personality issue, then chances are I'm just going to, you know, cut my losses and and walk away. So, and I haven't done that. I haven't done that. I found great home inspectors and uh, let's say electricians, you know, developing, I had had a challenging situation with a buyer where we needed an electrician in and we needed it fast. And it was a a guy that I got a referral from, you know, a work colleague from like colleague to colleague to colleague and now developing a relationship with this electrician that I will work with again in the future. You know, so I think that's important is you know, developing the relationship. And for me, it's the the level of service. What are they bringing to the table? And can I stand behind recommending them and walking away, feeling confident that they're going to serve my client, you know, so that that client is still happy with me? Because Mm -hmm. if I make a referral, that's a reflection on me. Well, I think in KW, listen, I'm originally originally a Toronto boy, so I've been here 18 years. And when I first moved here, and it still holds true now, um, everybody knows everybody. So you sit there and you're talking to someone like, oh, that guy is an idiot. And the person you're talking to is like, oh, that's my brother, right? Mm-hmm. Like everybody knows everybody. Small right? town, big city. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. when you refer business, that is, again, your personal brand. So if that person, you don't have that good feel, that person, it's a reflection on you. You screwed up because you referred me to this guy, right? Mm-hmm. So I run into that all the time. What about yourself, Annabelle? Well, pretty much Jenny nailed it. I mean, the the big thing for me is the responsiveness as well, right? So um, there's a lawyer that I work with. Unfortunately, he just sent me a note yesterday saying he's retiring. But um, I started working with him when I first got into the business because I was writing an offer and my client said, well, we're going to use this lawyer. And I said, can I call him and just make sure he's good? And Okay, yeah, no problem. Looked up his cell number on the Internet because that's all that was on the Internet, even though he's with Miller Thompson called him at six o'clock at night and he answered his cell phone, right? And so I thought, oh, this is 
probably the guy that I want for my lawyer and hence ended up sending lots of people to him, right? So I can send him a note Friday night that he's at the cottage and, you know, send him a status certificate. He'll ask one of the partners to review it and I can still have the information by Monday, right? That's, that's a big thing for me and for my clients as well, right? Because you don't want to lose out on a house because somebody on the team couldn't do a home inspection or couldn't do their piece of the puzzle right you're exactly right i think that's a huge point is their responsiveness because we don't have time you know in this market we we really don't our turnarounds are so quick yeah yeah so yeah joe what about yourself yeah i mean you uh, absolutely you both nailed it the only thing i could possibly add to that is um you know the, the group that i always work with for everything i do you know real estate's not perfect things go sideways and it's how quick that sideways can go straight again mm -hmm. you know yeah. instead of people just going oh my god it's gone sideways there's nothing we can do it's like whoa, whoa, whoa let's all get together how can we make this work what do we need to do to make this work and nobody you know again our emotions out of it even though you know when stuff starts going sideways you're like oh boy here we go you know but mm -hmm. also that team can work together and say no you know what we can do this we can do this we can do this we can do this and you know to make sure you know the seller or the buyers happy so that's that's also very important yeah uh, the, the the lawyer I work with I, I tell him I say if there's a question email me or call me don't yeah. call the client because second of I mean I know how I react doing my job getting a call from a lawyer I don't like that either I hate talking to lawyers no offense to the lawyers listening but um, I say call me right I, I don't want you to call a client because client gets a call from a lawyer oh crap what's going on you know email Steven you got to figure this out right just no you see my name come across me you yeah. call me don't don't call the client so you know just just having that relationship if he's up there at the cottage or whatever mm -hmm. it's it's important it's important so. well and those are the people you're probably going to deal with personally as well yeah right yeah i deal with my lawyer and, personally and there's a lot Absolutely. more weight behind a referral when you deal with someone personally yeah right well when you can sit there and say yeah i went to this guy myself well, that yeah, I mean, weight, right? you know, great example. Somebody will say something about, you know, they're working through a financing process and they're thinking about going to different lenders. Well, I know that I personally switched everything from TD to RBC because RBC had better service and does the firm approval process. So that has a lot more weight than if I banked with, you know, a credit union and said, oh, call Stephen at RBC. Yeah, right? absolutely. It's, it's absolutely. having those those resources in your in your those people in your toolbox mm. right clients love it too absolutely. hey what do i do about this oh here's my window guy oh here's my door guy oh here's this absolutely. guy here's my paper here's my landscaper it. right yeah right yeah actually, we got it all <laughs> yeah i actually had a note from somebody yesterday saying thank you so much i went to book my winter tire change and my appointment was right. going to be thursday and i'm here at three today because i said your name yeah. thank you yeah. <laughs> I'm like, totally. oh, yeah. great yeah we know everybody name dropping works man yeah. it's all good it's all good okay so uh funniest business story so uh annabelle let's come to you for this so funniest business story go i'm gonna preface this with i do not dislike cats because i have two cats and a dog um but at one point we were house shopping and this was a different niece and nephew of mine um and so we go into this house and it was around christmas time christmas tree was up and there was a cat in the house that like had just had enough it was a really busy listing people in and out we walked in the front door and this cat arched its back full claws out and started hissing and growling at us and so we kind of snuck around it went downstairs to look at the basement apartment came back up snuck around the cat again um, looked at the whole place and as we go to leave it's like right in front of us and my brother literally like i guess the seller had left a broom out just in case so my brother literally had to take the broom and like put it in front of my niece so that the cat wouldn't pounce on her. And it was just too funny, right? Like this poor oh, cat, it was gosh. tormented, but it was, <laughs> it was uh, just funny watching the two of them react. Lock up your pets, folks, lock up your pets. Yeah. <laughs> Jenny, what do you got? Oh, I get a doozy. So I was showing some clients uh, a house. Uh, it was uh, north of the city. And it was an older cottagey home and it was really cute. And so of course we go down to check out the basement to make sure, you know, what, what's down there. Cause it's an old, like it was a 90 or hundred year old house. And as we flick on the basement light, I look to my right and I go, oh! 
and everybody else behind me stops and we just look at these marionettes hanging and then, <laughs> oh, no. then we flick on another light and there's heads and body parts all over the table they were obviously obvious into marionettes and i just felt like i was in some some horror movie with you know these Criminal marionettes were going to start you know coming alive so and they weren't friendly looking marionettes they were really they were kind of bizarre so yeah i think that the best thing was the heads on the sticks and the body parts all over the table it was and by the way, they were fake body parts. They weren't real. They were, just yeah, they were that marionette body parts. Sure. Okay, yes, marionette just, body parts. Making sure we threw that part Interesting. in. Interesting. She doesn't was, hate cats, and those weren't real body it, parts. It we're good. Was, okay. yeah. All right. I'm <laughs> glad you left me for last, because I'm not going to go from funniest to scariest. Scariest, okay. So we're doing a home inspection on a house in Kitchener. And uh, just so you know, um, I am absolutely horrifically terrified of snakes. For no reason in the world, except for they instantly give you a heart attack and attack you and kill you. So we're doing a home inspection. <laughs> in Ontario. Yeah, in Ontario. Right. And, uh, and I have a picture sense. on my phone I can show you afterwards. So I'm down there with the home inspector and, and we're in the furnace room and we're chit-chatting away. And I look up into the rafters and here's this giant python curled up in a ball like this. So as a, a good realtor, I push the home inspector out of my way so I can get out the door quick enough. As I yell python, he runs like I've never seen before because he got bit by a rattlesnake up in Sobble Beach about five years beforehand. Scariest thing I've ever seen. Long short of it is the old owners had pythons. They got into the walls. They had laid babies. Oh. This house had pythons in it. Yeah, that's not scary. That's funny. <laughs> My I'm sorry, client, I'd be laughing. I tried. I should have used this one as the one I tried not to get them to buy. Bought the house. And a year later, woke up in the morning, there's another python in their bedroom. So I wish yeah. somebody had a video of that, Joe. I yeah, have, I have a picture of it. I have, I have uh, a picture no, of the I snake. Mean, a video of you pushing the home inspector out of the way. Oh, I would have pushed anybody out of the way to get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was the craziest thing. And I remember afterwards texting all, like, to everybody I knew. I was like, this is my job today. And like, they were Stay like, oh, my house. God. The oh, wow. How homes are you guys showing to your clients? Right? Man? What's right? going on? It oh, used wow. to be a rental, and the renters uh, had oh, a lot of happens. pets. It happens. It happens. Yeah. yeah. Those are pets all right. You'd be right? surprised what's out there. Yeah, you would. There have been bet. some listings. I, there was one uh, last year in Cambridge where you had to sign a waiver and put on a hazmat suit to go into it. Because it was um, a meth lab that had not been wow. remediated, oh. and it was a power sale. So yeah, and there was one recently that you weren't allowed to go into. That's over, right. Over that older one in June. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's one downtown Kitchener too. Same thing. You couldn't go in. Accepted offer only. Yeah. Yeah. There's I've another one too. with mold. Yeah, so mold such bad mold. Water you damage. couldn't go in. Yeah. Yeah, they're out there. Are these mm -hmm. people buying with cash? Because I know. Nobody's Most. lending on that. I was going to say, who the heck did the mortgage? <laughs> That's my first thought. Because, yeah. yeah, we no one would do too much with that one. The, the problem with that is, or or I guess, you know, you're, where, where we're seeing buyers go into that is people who want to do a flip. Yes. The problem is, do you have the tools in your toolkit to flip something like that, right? And can you even make money flipping, right? Well, People I think you have watching... to disclose it too, right? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. The disclosures yeah. are usually right there yeah. in the realtor notes for us. But, you know, people are watching like HGTV where they're seeing something in, you know, Charleston and, and you know, somebody's making $200,000 on a flip. But that's not this market. That's right. You know, right? Not at all. And so sometimes those real bad properties... People get interested in them because they feel that there's some upside on it. Yeah. So has HGTV, I know when I speak to home inspectors, they aren't real big fans of uh, Mike Holmes, but is HGTV, does that help you guys, hurt you? Because my wife watches those shows all the time. It drives me insane. One of my biggest things, uh, it's expectations. And so everybody's got HGTV expectations. I don't know if you guys have found this. Uh, and you just have to sometimes pair them back a little bit in you know the friendliest most professional nonchalant way that you know they they think they they literally are going to be on hgtv you know yeah. or i'm going to do what they did well no you're not and you know you've only got twenty five thousand dollar reno budget here, yeah right mm -hmm. you're not digging out the basement I think if they stick with just doing some nice flooring, some nice baseboards, some paint, maybe a new kitchen countertop, 
perfect. Don't try cutting down a wall, throwing in a beam yourself. You Finding know, you python snakes. Find python snakes. You're yeah. just going to get in trouble. Yeah. 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 yeah Help absolutely. them focus on the things that they yeah. can manage. Like, yeah. okay, so let's go for the bare bones. Let's look at the good bones of the house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you can, you know, you can do all of those yeah. cosmetics. If you want to open yeah. up a wall, call in a professional. Yeah. Right. And here's Take the number. Permit. And here's here's a number of a great guy that I work with, right? Yeah. Or yeah. gal. Yeah. So give me one piece of advice and Annabelle I'll start with you on this one give me one piece of advice you would give to someone who wants to be a real estate agent tomorrow well I think we talked about it a little bit and it's really just do your homework right understand what you're getting into go into the business with your eyes wide open because there are a lot of fees there is no other job that you are going to pay twenty five to forty thousand dollars a year in fees to do other than real estate Right? Um, so just do the research. Talk to the different brokerages. Check it out. See if maybe it's not for you. You have to be self-disciplined. Mm-hmm. Right? If you don't do that research up front, you're, you're not going to know. And there's a huge percentage of people who come into the business and are gone within the first two years. Oh, 50%, yeah. if not more. Well, it's more. Hey. Yeah. I heard it was something like 80%, but I might be off on that. But it's definitely yeah. a lot. Mm-hmm. And, then, and we're talking full-time people, yeah. too, because yeah. there's a lot of part-timers, yeah. right? Yeah. So, Jenny? I actually get this all the time because I, I've got adult kids, uh, and my eldest is 23, and then I've got a 20-year-old, and they're both in the workforce, and a lot of their friends sitting around the island saying, yeah, that looks like fun. We like We like watching what you do, and a lot of, you know young guys and young girls are sitting around there saying, I think I want to get my real estate license. Mm-hmm. And so I, I qualify that to say it's your real estate registration. And I said, you're not an agent, you're a representative. And then we all have a little giggle. And I say, so what are you taking in school? And you know, I think that the young people that want to get into real estate, I always suggest that you know you get another degree or a diploma behind you. Or even you some know, life experience. Right? Life experience. Like, right. you know, like get into some marketing. You need to take a business course because we're running our own businesses. And if it's a lot of work, mm-hmm. it, you don't, you, people don't realize how much energy and work we actually do. Um, and it, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Payoff's good when, when, it, when it starts to roll. And, but then, you know, it's not always a consistent market, right? So it's, uh, it's a lot of work and I, I think it's a great career. I think people should try it if they've done their research like Annabelle said and uh, know what they wanna do. Yeah, Joe? Um, I would say if I could give anyone advice, make sure this is what you wanna do. Make sure you're gonna put in the hours because mm-hmm. it is a ton of work I mean, if you just want to come in this and do uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight deals a year, you're not going to make a living. You mentioned the fees, right? You need to, if you're going to come in this, you have to treat it like a full-time job. You need to treat it like you get up every day, this is what you do. Mm-hmm. A lot of the people that come into this, and I've met tons of them in the five and a half years, I think they've watched a little bit too much TV, a little bit too much of the million dollar listings. And they think, they, you know, uh, so many of them, you see them in the office, they immediately go out and they buy the Mercedes, they buy the Audi, they buy the fancy car and the, and the, and the suits, and they think they're gonna be, you know, making 200 grand in the first year, and, the, and, and you don't see them after six months or eight months or 12 months, and it's just, you know, you gotta start, you gotta grind and grind and grind and do the open houses and make the phone calls, knock on the doors, you know, all the stuff you might be embarrassed to do or not wanna do, that's the only thing that's going to get you elevated to the point where your phone starts ringing. Mm-hmm. And is that not phones... a commentary in our generation, though, too, right now? The, the This new up-and-coming, like the, the kids around the table sort of thing, like uh, that you had at your house, like is it – they just want everything now. Yeah. They, they see the shows walking around with their Starbucks, million-dollar listing, sure. and how luxurious it is, and, oh, well, we have to work for this? Yeah. Like, I and... wish it was that easy. I think we all do. Yeah. Right? It would be I, great. I, the... I mean, the three of us are sitting here, and obviously, we know we've got to do a lot of stuff that we don't like doing. Sure. Like, there's a lot of stuff that I, it's not my favorite thing to do, but I do it because that's what's propelling my business, my business forward. And it's not all about showing houses no. and putting signs on the lawn. You know, that's, that's the perk. Yeah. Yeah, that's when you win. 
That's when, that's when a When you're good putting day, offers right? in and putting up listings, that's the win. Yeah. But I mean, what you had to do all of this to get that, yeah. you know. People and don't pe- get that though. People, well, and people from the outside, and you guys can probably contest this. Like, ah, oh, you're in real estate. You guys don't do much. You make great money. You know, it's like, oh, all right, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah. Come for a week with me. Come and hang out. See what I do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I even talk to clients about this, and they're like, oh, you know, when I'm breaking down what the realtor fee is going to be, and, you know, 5%, I always throw in there 5%. I try to help you guys out here. 5%. Okay. And they're like, whoa. I'm like, yeah, but you know what, though, guys? I said, take that minus whatever 30 35% for taxes then they got to pay the brokerage it's really only this and then they've got to pay their own bills so i said big picture this is what it really is yeah. right and we're is splitting it, it. and the, exactly <laughs> yeah. right so you know once they figure all that out and they're like okay well i guess you know like well my realtor drives a really shiny car i'm like well you do too so what <laughs> what are you having this argument for <laughs> i think that's the biggest thing in our business it costs money to to be in real estate absolutely yeah yeah yeah, right. yeah like you mentioned the expenses well that's not even that scratches the surface right mm-hmm. because now you've got photos three four hundred dollars for photos yeah. depending on what kind of photographer mm-hmm. you're having mm-hmm. you'd have drone photos oh, yeah. you have to pay to have a guy drive up and put the for sale sign in the lot yeah. Yeah, yeah right there's a, there's all kinds that's of expenses if you're expenses. doing your paperwork yourself because if you're right. you know you're hiring you know you've got admins and social yeah. media oh people i've got an and, assistant i have to yep. pay an assistant Absolutely. like i mean like, it's everything right yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah you know but you're right you you your Wearing truck, your or your truck, your car, your suits, your outfits, your hair, like there's everything surrounds real estate, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's great for the economy because we sell a house and look at the spinoff. You know, you got lawyers, bankers, uh, truck drivers, you know, movers, they like absolutely everything, you know? It's a good spinoff business to keep the economy going. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. It is true. Well, I think I need shares in the gas oil companies right now. <laughs> my goodness. I just looked at my mileage for the month and I was like, whoa. Oh, yeah. you, you need to uh, look at my Facebook page and call the people that I tagged there. Because, well, that I shared, tagged, whatever. They come deliver gas to your house. No way. Yeah. Well, and they're convenient. reasonably priced. So there, there you go. go. Business you for that? everything, eh? Yeah. Business for everything. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Um, homestead. I'm sorry, I'm going off on some different directions. This will be one of my last questions. What uh, home staging? Do it. Don't do it. Do it yourselves. Hire someone to do it. What do you guys do? Situational. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awkward space. Empty. Stage it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, as people walk in, they're like, "Ooh, a triangle-shaped room. <laughs> what do I do here?" Yeah. Home stagers are great. Uh, sometimes you don't need them though because sometimes we've done enough business I'm sure all of us that we can walk in somewhere and tell our clients this is what they need to do Mm -hmm. but then there's the the empty spaces or the clients that even if you tell them they would rather hear it from somebody else yeah I actually went to the extra step of taking my interior decorating certificate so that I could identify those issues and I'm I'm not naive like there's times when it's it's beyond me right so yeah there it's very situational um, sometimes you walk into a house and it's got good bones and, you know, you, you just make do. I, one of my biggest pet peeves is when I walk into a home and it's been staged a little bit, like just a little bit, and it just nothing matches, right? And then it, it's like, okay, you're trying too hard, right? But, you know, I think it definitely it's situational and, yeah. and it can make a house. And then I think there's sometimes when it's not necessary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about you, Annabelle? Yeah, same thing. Really, it's situational. And sometimes you get buyers who are actually turned off by houses that are overly staged, right? Yeah, I don't know if you guys have, have been in, in a property like that, but, you know, I've had clients who we are in the house and they're like, nobody even lives here, do they? Like, this is ridiculous. They'll go look in the fridge, right? <laughs> First thing I always do, I'm yeah. like, oh, somebody lives here. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. just staged, guys. Yeah. They do live open, here, open right? Open the closet. And, yeah. and so for that, for some people, that's a real turn off now. Yeah interesting okay folks well listen uh we're all about shameless plugs here so uh just real quick we're gonna go around the table give your name give your contact info if people like what they heard they can reach out to you annabelle go annabelle tranner remax real estate don't Center. say your facebook page oh just no. go just go right to your name and phone number okay <laughs> I'm bugging you. No hashtags? So no my, hashtags. my cell, you can always call my cell. You can text my cell, whatever you like. It's 519-591-7653. 
If you don't remember the 7653, just remember 519-591-SOLD, and it'll work. At 2 a.m., it absolutely will work. Any time of day. Definitely. Except 6 a.m. Okay. <laughs> You're finally asleep by then. That's right. <laughs> Jenny. I uh, Just my number there, Steve. Uh, no, whatever you want to throw out there. Facebook, Jenny, Jenny Fisher Sales Representative. Instagram, Jenny Fisher Sales. And my direct line is 519-806-6165. Awesome. Joe. All right. Uh, yeah, you can find me, uh, joedykes.com, um, or on Facebook and on Instagram. It's Do It With Dykes. And my direct number is 226 808 8304. Awesome. All three of you, thank you for coming in. Uh, it was great having you. Um, as usual, everything went different directions. So it's just nice having a conversation with people who I know do good work with their clients. So thank you very much to all of you for coming on in. Thanks, well, thanks for, for having us. us. Yeah. There you go. There is the end of our first Realtor Roundtable. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to follow me on both Facebook and Twitter with the same handles, RBC Stephen Green, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Green Effect Podcast. Subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Google Play so you catch the next episode. And don't forget to leave a review. Much appreciated.